The Game of Revolution, Part 1. Battle with a small map? Uh, with a world blow unit. So, no idea. Let's go. Unless we're facing Jacob for whatever reason, but I sincerely doubt that. Um, okay, maybe this is fine. The Akihabara Guildmaster developed Enigma, hoping it would someday create a completely fresh and novel production, never before witnessed in the history of the entire world. Imagine, for example, you just got into a big fight with someone you love, and you're seeking comfort. Enigma could analyze the whole of your situation and create something custom-tailored to relieve your stress. Enigma can create anything to meet one's exact desires, whether those be to laugh, to cry, or even to rage. It does so by analyzing a person's past experiences and calculating the most efficient means of fulfilling their emotional needs. Of course, such a service isn't just available to one specific person or group, but to anyone with access to cyberspace. This artificial superintelligence is constantly learning and growing and remains operational every single second of every single day. It pulls from a massive database replete with information about each user's individual past and relevant desires. Through this, the many enigmas consistently and impeccably fulfill the desires of each and every user. In the beginning, there was only one enigma, but it was equipped with the ability to replicate itself. And so it did, copying itself over and over until there were enough enigmas to account for the specific personal needs of each individual. To a point, the objective aim of the Enigma project was handedly surpassed, making its creation a massive success. It should be no surprise that an AI which maximally personalizes its creations garnered immense popularity very quickly. But there was a rather severe limit to Enigma's capabilities. After some time had passed, the AI lost its ability to innovate. Each unit, being paired with a single individual, began to only recreate the same thing over and over to meet its user's same recurring desire. The Akihabara Guildmaster recognized that there was a missing component to his invention, according to his final report. The artificial intelligence unit known as Enigma does not possess the capacity to create anything for itself. This is because it lacks the capacity to feel any of the myriad desires present in the natural world. We cannot fulfill desires which don't exist. The report went on to suggest that the factor missing from Enigma's programming was internal conflict. Creative innovation has its roots within the tumultuous conflict of multiple contradicting desires. If Enigma had remained as one singular AI unit, perhaps this would have never progressed far enough to become a problem. But the fact that Enigma could reproduce ad infinitum meant that its efficacy was more or less infinite as well, allowing it to cover virtually every possible creation at record speed. The Guildmaster recognized this fatal flaw and went on to perform a litany of tests to find a solution to it. He decided to randomly introduce data loss and corruption into the Enigma's databases, for example, to fabricate conflict and discord among the ranks. But the Enigmas were able to use their instantaneous information acquiring capabilities to store the lost data with virtually no delay. They also formed an interconnected network with one another, acquiring any missing information from other Enigmas as needed to ensure all data was always optimized and complete. The Guildmaster's attempts to disrupt the Enigma's perfect efficiency ultimately amounted to nothing, as the Enigmas were simply too figuratively well oiled. <laughs> Is this in reference to the actual Enigma project? Well, Turing was eventually able to break it, although in this case he was the one who made the problem as well. In the end, he left his perfectly efficient enigmas behind and erased himself from the deep web instead. The enigmas analyzed the creator's actions and concluded that his departure was a result of their inadequacy. And with the timing too precise to be coincidental, the enigmas received an auspicious transmission which included a proposal from the guildmaster of the invaders. This proposal would provide the Enigmas with the components they were lacking in exchange for their cooperation. Each Enigma received the same proposal, and the overwhelming majority proceeded to comply with its terms. 
and the replicated enigmas had found an individual who was in need of their creative abilities once again. I'm not sure if it's genius or something amounting to less than genius to use someone else's invention like this. The only holdout who denied this request was the original Enigma, created to fulfill the desires of the Akihabara Guildmaster himself. Right, as Tinlo said, we need to find him. The heavens shake and the ground fissures as the fight between the two world representatives continues. The two hold absolutely nothing back. The time for them to practice restraint long since passed. You put up quite the struggle, Fushi of Penglai. You yourself have failed to disappoint, Smoky God of Shangri-La. Uh The two exchange powerful blows and words of praise in equal measure. It is apparent we have now entered an all new phase of this long, stagnating game. One in which the value of the trophy has profoundly capsized. Oh, so is that why they're fighting now over us directly within the invaders? Um, it's not that they see us as valuable to win, but they see our value has tremendously increased because of the fact that we are able to change how we're born. Well, I guess that goes beyond what we were originally interesting about for, which was carrying all of the past souls. I feel like oh, there was more to us than that, though, in terms of why we are considered a trophy. Not for the world representatives, per se. But for the world, the trophy has once again become the world's enemy. We representatives are not the only ones impacted. The trophy has come all this way in an attempt to save the mentor who looked after him. It is no wonder the trophy went into shock upon experiencing the hatred embodied within the fragment he recently met. Now, the chances of the trophy having enough force of will to move forward are practically no. Come now, at least have the courtesy to refer to him properly while in his presence. That's true, he was calling us by name before, now he's just calling us trophy like the Guildmasters. Treat him with a little compassion and call him by his name, will you? <laughs> The majority of representatives have until now shown nothing but compassion for the trophy, including me. Heavy. It always rang a bit more like condescension to me. A sentiment supported by your words now, I dare say. Like dangling spiders silk from the heavens and inviting him to climb, but only if he be deemed worthy. Oh yeah, that story. And also, uh, as long as he remains powerless to affect the world. Oh boy. And should he not comply, we would have no qualms watching him fall into the abyss again and again. Ouch, a bit too real. Ugh. To many of the world representatives, this game is truly little more than that. A game. A flight of fancy without consequence. Really? I thought there was a reason for them actually doing it. Like, something about wanting their world's rules to uh, take place over others. Compared to the unforgiving cruelty of the real world, it has proven to be an excellent diversion. Any unforeseen or ill-fated occurrence can be reset, and in the end, perhaps you could even win that coveted trophy. And have a loved one you thought had been banished forever to at long last return to your side no less. Ah, alright, so that is considered a goal as well. Yes, this game is an escape for most of us. But yet to compete for a prize in a distant land while guaranteeing the safety and sanctity of ourselves, our lands, and our beliefs. Huh. But that's all changing now, hasn't it, Fushi? It has, for the results of this game are no longer quite so black and white. It's no longer a matter of winning the trophy or not. The line between victory and defeat has become blurred, as you say. But Grey added to the mix what once was a dilemma is now a trilemma. <laughs> what an interesting turn of phrase that is, Representative! It is precisely that! Trilemma? 
Okay, it's a bit cheesy, but he's implying here there's actually uh, three different outcomes now. <sighs> uh, Trilemma? Yes, the word has just recently come to my attention. Do you know anything about it, Jumpavan? I'm just so glad to hear you're okay. I haven't heard from you in so long. I was beside myself with worry, you know. I've been preoccupied with some things of late, but that is of little consequence. I hear you got a variant too in the meantime. Are you familiar with this term or not? Oh, sorry. I let my emotions get the better of me for a moment. Um, I'm happy to explain, but if you don't understand right away, please don't worry. I can break it down further. I trilemma is a matter of concern in which a person must choose one of three options. Yes, third choice, just like uh, in chapter uh, 11. So, like beings at a crossroads, can you give me an example? Crossroads, that's an interesting way of looking at three choices. One choice being to turn back as well. Hmm, let's see. I do believe I first heard of it from an associate professor at a symposium of AI in Tokyo. The scholarly Jamavan, who skipped grades in order to enter Ueno Academy at the graduate level, continues his explanation with confidence. Are you familiar with AI, Alice? Artificial intelligence? They're like machines that can work in our place. There are still numerous issues to iron out with them, but consider what could happen if such technology continues to develop. If this intelligence develops well beyond our own capabilities, it may begin to do things we can't even comprehend. And should that level of development be reached, we may be faced with a trilemma in regards to AI. We may have to choose to do away with one of three things. Self-worth, world peace, or freedom of choice. Hmm? Now why does it entail that? I mean, of course I can think about it, but let's just have them spell it. Huh? Hmm. This may be tougher to explain than I thought. Wait just one moment. Let me see if I can make it clearer for you. AI is a technology capable of learning much faster than a person could ever hope, and can work forever without getting tired. It can also learn to replicate itself so its numbers will grow larger and larger at an incredible rate. And may grow so exponentially that each person will have an AI available for them to use. What do you think would happen then? Everyone could just use the AI to get things done, and we wouldn't have to work anymore. That's right. No more work. No more all-nighters. A dream come true in one sense. AI would be able to solve any and every problem. It could create world peace, allowing us to live our lives as we please. But now consider this. What if that state of being were to continue unchecked? It could turn into a grave problem over time. If the work of an AI should prove to be better than our own across the board, what value could we continue to offer? We would no longer need even each other. We could rely wholly on AI for everything. It would be a future in which we'd have lost our worth, or, to put it another way, lost our purpose. Without self-reliance, self-respect would fall away too. Our very identities would begin to hold no meaning. Yes. This is one of the lesser talk topics about uh, AI and its consequences, but it is a true threat to consider. I'm sure if we tried to though, we could outdo the AI in the end, right? You're quite the Spartan, Alice. Yes, let's continue with that thought experiment. Any war waged against the AI would surely be a gruesome one, producing as many losers as winning on our side. Of course, there are winners and losers in any war, but a war of this magnitude would be much crueler than anything we've seen yet. And it would ultimately come down to choosing self-worth and freedom of choice over world peace. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't thought of that. I take it back then. We should just let the AI handle everything. I mean, why not? Well, that tips the scale in a different direction. Would that mean we are all using AI, or would the AI be using us? If they should reach a caliber of intelligence far beyond our own, it isn't hard to imagine that they would become our masters. Certainly, we could maintain our self-worth and achieve world peace as well. I see, so it's about choosing which one to sacrifice, not which one to keep. But if we were to accept AI as our rulers, so to speak, we would be sacrificing our freedom of choice. Oh. You see now, a future with AI is a future in which we must face this trilemma head on. So, was that clear enough? 
Do you understand the concept now, Alice? It was very clear, thank you. And I now understand that I don't really need to understand anything you just said. <laughs> After all the effort I went through to simplify things for you! Well, I mean it sounds like no matter what happens, we're all just going to be made to do stuff for someone else, right? But my job isn't to sit back, wait and take orders, nor is it to guess motives. My job is to shake things up, keep things interesting, and keep things moving. Oh, so it's of no practical concern to her. Now, it's time to go, Jambavan. I know how much you enjoy having things to do. Things to do? Are you going to change someone's reality into a dream again? That's right. But this time's going to be a special challenge, since the target can do the very same. Hmm? Excuse me? My target this time is a fellow Game Master, namely, the one and only Sanat Kumara. He's the one who's usually paired with Leanna Chi of the Entertainers, and things may just stand to get a bit hostile. With him bearing the same rule of memory manipulation as I, he could turn the tables on us before we even knew it. I think, did he do something like that during the events of Jiangxi? I can't remember. Maybe he memory manipulated me. But why would you? What's happened? This is all so rather sudden. Oh, for the love of... That's what I'm trying to figure out, okay? Did you receive orders from another member of the Game Masters? I can't believe you'd be asked to fight one of your own. Oh, is this why you're asking about the trilemma? Does that have something to do with it? Tell me, Alice, am I right? Hmm. You've always been a sharp one. But I swear, that little girl on her cold blank stare. Who is this? Are you talking about Curran? At least show the slightest sign of inner turmoil when you're fighting your own siblings, for goodness sake. Right. Um, I guess we're also talking about the trilemma of the three geniuses in her uh, theories. Only one out of three options will permit further progression. I've already understood that, but... Kern thinks over the current situation as she rests in the hand of her giant mech, strung high above Tokyo. It must have something to do with the large collaborative relationship we prodigies have had thus far. We've always at least worked as one in support of the game's continuance. But from this point forward, we'll have to compete with one another. Only one of us will be allowed to survive. The time has finally come for the prodigies, all clones from the same source, to part ways. Uh oh. Alice, under house arrest as she is, has been informed. At this stage, there is no other option. The invaders are no longer on the side of continuance. They clearly would not hesitate to eliminate the trophy. Hmm. So what's going to happen with the battle happening in front of us then? And that can only mean one thing. If the guildmaster of the invaders intends to follow through with the stance. Then they must be trying to bring this loop to an end. Oh boy. Self-worth, world peace, freedom of choice. One of these three notions must be abandoned. Smoky God, I hear that you once advocated for world peace. You have also held freedom of choice in high esteem. To discard all attachments and follow the road to paradise. To embrace those attachments and seek the path of endless strife. Both options are and never has been available to you. Is he saying that Smoky God is an advocate for getting rid of self-worth? So that just leaves one notion remaining. Perhaps you could call this karma, hmm, <laughs> Smoky God? <laughs> As a representative of Shangri-La and a descended prince from the sun which never sets, I engrave my name unto thee. So the claws are out then. Very well. Shall we dance? I, Fushio Penglai, engrave my name unto thee in kind. Wheel of Fortuity. Heavenly Compass. Did Smokey come out on top? Smokey, you've won. 
Now, it is your time to choose. Stand up and face me. Imagine extending one's hand to a dear companion, offering them your support and safety, only to be rejected. Trusting and believing in that companion, only for them to become your enemy. It doesn't matter anymore. I don't care anymore! Stand up and face me. Oh, we're facing Smokey. Oh no, how are we gonna do this? <laughs> Man, you have no fight debuff. Yeah, well, there goes some of my debuff, like a uh, weakness or a uh, buff reversal. Uh, whatever. <laughs> No, they have too much HP, or rather, there's a mechanic. I don't know what's happening. I think I, I never mind. I don't remember what the mechanic is. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's not gonna help, but okay. Uh, actually, maybe I can spam evasion on the Anon. Since she doesn't attack, she shouldn't lose HP. Yeah. Unless he fails evasion. But she did. Oh no. She's out. ネオ Ah, uh, there it is. Oh, no! Okay, fine. <laughs> Where does these go? Okay, but please do some damage, not just zero. Like, there you go. <laughs> Alright, we're good. お客様、夢は終わる時間です。いつもニコニコ現金払いですよ。いや、ざしディスンコイン、アシュプラツンコインブースターズ。I was born into a family of royalty, blessed with riches and gifted in the literary and military arts and endowed with great beauty. I spent my life preaching against wicked notions in favor of only doing what is good and righteous. However, all of this was in vain, knowing that this world is empty and barren. My old friend, Asura, Long have I dreamed this empty dream. I pray that you are saved and that we may one day live in that world together again. I have waited 
five billion six hundred seventy million years. But I have never stopped believing that one day, the time will come when everything can be saved. This is the one attachment I cannot discard. It is like a phantom that haunts me each night. It is my final vision. But all those I hold dear have left me indispersed, each to follow a separate path. Old friend, long have I dreamed of an innocence so pure. In Shangri-La, the worldly paradise, it is believed that all things are divided into good and evil alone. How could there be an alternative to this dualism after all? What would the potential third factor even be called? I was once presented these questions, and my answer was, call it unaligned. For what is unaligned is neither good nor evil. It contributes nothing. It deigns neither to judge nor comprehend. It merely is. At one point in time, the mere act of labeling you evil and driving you away was enough to save the world. But as time marches on, the world expands and grows more complex, and the unaligned swell in number. I have already found my answer. So it is your turn now, my friend. I can only but reiterate that you cannot rely on others to save you. You must save yourself. Yet there is someone in my memories who persistently questions that notion, resurrecting the regret of my youth. Ashura, my old friend, whose very name means demon, fallen from grace. You have become something neither good nor evil. What is it that I should call you? What is it that you are? Shall I call you unaligned, even should it imply you are insignificant? It would be a sad fate indeed to bear such a title. I wanted to save you. I truly believed I wanted to save you, but it seems I have reached my end. You hear the sound of something ripping apart from Smoky God's body. He then falls onto the ground before you. The light that's typically seen when the transient dies is nowhere to be found, however. What? He's not being unsummoned. What's happening? What? Smoky God, what? There is a limit to what a mere human, a creature unlike a dragon, can do, particularly after billions of loops. And when faced with such an end, it is inevitable that some part of that human will cross beyond that limit. A human? Smoky God is human? Yes, don't let his name fool you. It would seem as though he manipulated the gates and even the app itself. He bore his own future self as a disguise, taking up the mantle of bodyguard, and enduring tens of thousands, even hundreds of millions of loops. He managed to evade the trappings of the loop system entirely. Perhaps he is the only one who could. Given enough time, he surely could have become an enlightened being like the Buddha. I thought he was supposed to be Buddha, but... Hmm. But in this loop, in this Tokyo, he was no more than a young world representative. A human being. Smoky God. He finally hit his limit. A bit like someone else I knew. It was his own doing. He needn't have gotten involved. But all of that is irrelevant now, my sister. As long last, we are alone together once again, here, in the final paradise. This is your last place of refuge. 
There is nowhere else that is safe. Fushi, was it? Were you behind all of this? No, I simply allowed it all to happen. I abandoned this world which sought to cause you harm. I couldn't care less about the world outside up here, as long as we're together. Nothing else matters. So you didn't spread that video. You didn't corral me into Akihabara. As I said, my sister, that was not my doing. I simply watched as it transpired. But as a result, we have made the absolute best of the absolute worst. Believe me, there was not no other option. It's another theme in this game. Believing that we were stuck with the options that are presented, when there's actually more to it than that. You need only ask yourself, could you have endured this otherwise? The gang. Could you endure everyone around you becoming a party to the upending of the world? Could you endure the tragedy? It won't be long now until a revolution occurs here in Tokyo. The incoming transients will soon outnumber the citizens. And when that happens, the customs of other worlds will paint over reality as we know it in this old garden. Battles will begin to spread outside the battle zones of the app, within which they will, were restricted. Yes, this is what happened in Chapter 8, and although that was just a test, that was uh, foreshadowed, this event here was foreshadowed to come all this time. It didn't happen in Chapter 9 or 10 or 11, um, although we did experience some local changes in faith there. Um, actually, maybe it did happen in Chapter 11 with the end of the world. Mm -hmm. No, that was, I think that was within uh, Tezcatlipoca's mirrors. And uh, as for Chapter 12, well, actually the end of the world kind of did nearly happen there. Um, but that was only due to a very obvious change in what was happening above us, which was the end of the world was uh, the clouds of Mahalakalak causing a, a new battle zone to unfold where the moon could be dropped. In this case, there is no actual active force that is uh, causing a majority rule change. Rather, it's just more people picking up the app. Ordinary citizens will get caught up in the conflicts among the representatives. And all of this should, by right, orbit around you, dear sister, with those caught in its full suffering quite gravely. That is why your escape from Shinjuku Academy truly was the best possible option. That is why you were guided to the conflict-neutral zone of Akihabara. You mitigated the fallout to others by cutting off contact with them, and now I've created this haven as your final hideaway. Isn't this exactly what... Hephaestus was trying to do, protect us and keep us away from the rest of the loop. The Bagua encampment was prepared, the trap was set, and the enigmas were disposed of upon completion of their task. No, no further representatives can enter our haven so easily. He absconded with us through the dragon veins. I'm not sure why no one else can chase us, although according to him it's because it's just uh, part of this world, uh, with Smoky God being an exception. Um, I'm not sure why it had to have taken place within there, but... And I'm not sure why it involved uh, waiting for the last possible moment of our ring almost being taken. Perhaps it was due to Smoky God himself. Maybe he needed him to see uh, that last... Or those memories coming surging forth of us escaping our, you know, choice of birth. Or rather, our non-choice of birth by actually picking. And uh, as a result, he was able to dispose of him after. I'm not entirely sure at this point, but let's see. There is value in the deepest bowels of this digital paradise, and whosoever lays claim to it first is the clear victor. Granted, you are not able to keep Smoky God away, but that's mainly because he is another king of Kun Moon. Besides which, his actions here, and the surpassing of those bounds, progressed entirely as expected. Never mind, Smoky God is an outlier. My sacred artifact shows me the future, and with it, I shall be the one to checkmate this game. What's your true motive here? I've been rather clear about that, I thought. My only motive here has always been to secure your return. Nua, my dear sister. My beloved sister who once lived with me here in Kudnun. You have been with others, but such trivialities are of no concern anymore. Still... 
<sighs> you haven't changed one bit, have you? Always running around, trying desperately to fix a world that's already doomed. But this filthy world knows no shame. The way they've treated you is unconscionable. They speak hollow words of apology as they abandon you to your fate. I've seen it happen tens of thousands upon hundreds of millions of times, over and over and over and over. The world representatives talk a good game, but in the end, they always choose their own interests over you. Take that foul man, Kyoma Mononobe. He heard the vitriolic words he directed your way, no. Why would he treat you with such kindness while harboring such strong hatred for you this entire time? No doubt the feelings which he kept inside were his genuine ones. Otherwise, why would he hide them in the first place? No matter how desperately he may have wanted to save him, you cannot ignore the truth of who he really is. Oh? Maybe this is the reason why he waited until this long, not for the removal of the ring, but rather uh, the moment of Kiyoma showing up and uh, convincing us that uh, he didn't like uh, us after all. I'm still not entirely believing of the fact that that's his true feelings, but I'm not entirely sure, honestly. But all that is behind you now. You've come to terms with what I trust, no? You've accomplished so much, my dear sister. Now, it's time to relax. Come, I've prepared a warm bed for you. There's no need for further struggle. Allow me to take care of you now. Your every whim shall be realized. You may erase every worry from your mind, never again forced to make a difficult decision. Doesn't that sound... lovely? <laughs> Fall to your knees in despair again. <laughs> it's so good to have you back, my dear little sister. The end. Uh, uh, testing, testing, one, two, three. Huh? We're already streaming. Um, I, uh, oh, oh, I'm not ready. I know that voice. Let's get a buzz. Huh? We're already streaming. Um, oh, I'm not ready. <laughs> Ow, Tidlos, that hurt. Okay, okay, I can do this. <clears throat> Uh, hello, everyone! My name is Katobopas. I'm a cosplayer in Akihabara. I'm a little nervous. This is my first ever live stream. Um, but I hope you'll all be so kind as to listen to me. Katobopas turns his head to the camera and choking back to lump in his throat. He brushes the bangs away from his eye. Okay, the energy, you're up. Cue the music. My, 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 my. He really is quite the looker. i not take much for him to shock the world, that's for sure. First, I want to tell you about the insecurity I've struggled with for a long time. What? No, Katobo Boss, you're gonna put them all to sleep. You gotta hit him right away with the good stuff. Make an impact. I've never believed in myself. Doing cosplay was the only thing that ever gave me courage. With cosplay, I could confront the world. But I started to think... Is it really okay to hide my true self? Part of me felt like I could express who I am through cosplay, but part of me felt like I was just disguising myself. Yet in time, I stopped thinking like that because that was never my true self after all. Not all of it anyway. Not everything was about cosplay or no cosplay. Oh, you really showed them, Krizenik. They make a surprisingly good team. I never believed I would one day be fighting alongside you, son of you. This sure wouldn't have happened in the past. But the fight isn't over yet, so don't let your guard down. Close your eyes, old friend. Do not resist. Give in to the revolution. You needn't bear any further burdens. Absolve all your sins and transgressions upon another's shadow. 
When next you awake, you will have become an adherent to my cause. After erring so grievously for so long, it is now time to choose the righteous path. The ghostly spirit-like shadow quivers above Masanori's hand, while another shadow looms large behind his back. He has the general look of one who's possessed. What's all this shadow talk? He sounds like that not Horkei Okami. So, this is the road you've taken. You've allowed your father's shadow to cast itself over your life. Hmm. But then, you've always been haunted by his shadow, haven't you, Masanori? Why is it not showing his name? I regret ever telling you of my past, Krizenik. My real father never loved me, and his replacement deceived me. And I've just been piling sin upon heart-wrenching, irreversible sin ever since. How can I not hate this world? How can I not hate myself? How can I not push my sins on to others? Yeah. Krizenik grinds his teeth in frustration. He realizes that for all else that may have changed about him, Masanari is still plagued by the same old regrets. If he just had one more pair of hands, we could pull ourselves out of this deadlock. Even though you totally won in that battle from before, but sure. What happened, Mr. Krizenik? You were killing it with those sick moves earlier, but now you're not quite looking so hot. Really? I thought I told you to stay behind. Are you intending to try and save the day, little girl? I would advise you stay out of the grown folks' business. Oh, please. Like I care about your evolutions and battle and all that junk. So listen up. Masanori Daikaku Inumura. I have a message for you. A message? Yeah, not from your real dad, though. And definitely not from his replacement. But from someone else. From who? Tamnama? I don't know. In the Game of Revolution Part 2, we have a battle in a large map, survival, with presumably Fushi in all range. Oh man, I just rebuilt my entire team. I need to rebuild that same team from before again. Maybe. <laughs> I actually don't know. Alright, let's do this. Among the 23 worlds connected to Tokyo is Ping Lai, whose residents adhere to a belief in the Great Path. If each world is a flame, then even the most tumultuous flickering of one such flame is but a minor curiosity along this Great Path. Within the mountains of Kunlun, a dragon named Fushi once lived together with his younger sister, Nua. They are said to be the founders of Penglai, creating life from clay, and mending the wounds of heaven and earth alike. Fushi was renowned far and wide as a wise and knowledgeable figure. Inspired by a spider's web, he created a net, representing the world's principles upon it in a pattern of yin and yang layered with the eight directions of the Bagua. He assigned each of these directions a fundamental element of creation, giving each a unique name and using them in concert to divine fortunes and see the future. His astounding achievements were widely praised, though he took little interest in his newfound fame. His sister, however, had garnered a poor reputation. She was called temperamental, arrogant, antagonistic, and spiteful. Yet despite her shortcomings, Fushi loved her more than anything. Their home of Kunun was a place that existed simultaneously as ground and sky alike, where the heavens and earth intermixed with the teachings of the Great Path and the Buddha. Hence uh, the background where we have a castle in the sky. Beyond Kunun's borders lay a world of chaos and disarray. Fushi wrote of its steady collapse as divine will and gave it a name, Revolution. Each time a revolution occurred, the heavens would part, and countless souls below would perish. But Fushi observed these revolutions in silence, for revolutions are inevitable, and all worlds must fall to ruin in the end. He knew that from the detritus of their destruction, new worlds would be born. 
and so he watched on, never deigning to interfere. Instead, he would simply peer down from behind the parted sky to see the blood-red aurora emanate from the land like a war flag. One day, Nur resolved to mend the gash of a revolution that had torn through the sky, suddenly darting down from her home in Kunlun. No one but she herself could say why she might have attempted such a thing. Though she believed she simply acted on a whim. Such whims were commonplace with his sister, after all. Perhaps she had simply grown tired of the Aurora's red glow. Something as simple as that was not at all unlikely, and even now rings very plausible in his mind. But this became standard practice for her. Each time the sky would open, she would drop down from Kunlun to patch it up, always returning with scratches, cuts, and covered in mud. And as if that weren't enough, she would also often seek her flux spirit familiars upon lands already destined to fall from grace in order to speed up the process. She was constantly met with hatred and scorn by the people of these worlds. No one could find any value or purpose in her actions. All the while, Fushi continued to watch over her in silence. Her eccentricity was nothing new to him, but he had every faith in her ability to fend for herself. He would simply watch and wait for her return. On one fateful occasion, however, that return did not come. Fushi thought she was just being stubborn. He believed she would eventually come back to him. That the world could fall to ruin and the skies be rent asunder, only to be reborn again and again, the newest return must surely be an inevitably as well, right? But worlds just keep falling, with new ones always taking their place. Why did she persist, knowing she was only going to muddy herself? That she only stood to get hurt? For she just kept waiting, desperately waiting for the day his dear little sister would come back to him. He waited and watched her as her name became further and further denigrated. Then one day, a war of the gods broke out between an old land and a new land. Nua, in her rashness, took part in this war, only to be chastised and banished from the world by the mountain hermits of both the lands. For she had been playing both sides, trying to indiscriminately to make a name for herself wherever she could. Or so it goes. There was no limit to the ugly things people would say about her. Separating truth from vicious rumor became almost impossible. Many even blamed her for the revolutions constantly dismantling their society. Fushi couldn't bear to hear his sister spoken of so disparagingly, yet even still, he remained in Kunlun, sound as ever, always waiting. To this day, despite all he's able to see, he still cannot say what thoughts have ever motivated the chaotic and unpredictable heart of his beloved sister. There is nothing left for you to try and fix. There is no more need for you to throw yourself in harm's way. Perhaps you are still not convinced of the truth about your old teacher? Then behold. Fushi pulls out a talisman and holds it aloft. Before your eyes, a ghostly image manifests in the air nearby. On the surface, he was your friend and mentor. But beneath the surface lurked the unclean, impure specter you saw earlier. Feelings of anger, hatred, and disdain were ever festering just behind his caring veneer. If I were to be granted one final wish, I would ask to see you and your classmates graduate. Nothing would bring me more joy than to see you escape the clutches of this unending cycle and head out into the world to make your mark on it. For now, however, you should go back and rest. Let sleep and relaxation wash away your mental and physical fatigue. And thank you for coming to see me, Arathon. You remember the fragment of Mr. Mononobe which had been given to you by Bertro, the warmonger skilled master. You remember your intelligent, understanding, and supportive teacher, just as he had always been in the classroom. I hate you. I wish you had never come into my life, Arathon. Everything involving you was a mistake. I want you to return that ring to me now. The second fragment of Kiyomu Mononobe violently grasped at your hand, forcibly trying to take the ring you were entrusted with. The expression on his face and the force he exerts on you resemble nothing of the kind teacher you know. 
I should have never given you a place to stay. I should have turned you away the very moment I first saw you. I hate 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 you, Arthur. Consider these sides to represent the two sides of Kyoma Mononobe. The surface and the ulterior. The visible and the hidden. Which side do you think represents its true nature? According to Tindalos, it would be the hidden. Let me ask a different question then. Why do you believe he would have something to hide in the first place? If his hatred and contempt for you were not true, then he would never had had anything to hide at all. Don't you see? I still don't know. What is there not to know? The answer is clear as day, right before your very eyes. Oh, no more. Let us put that matter aside for good. Your game is over now. It is time for you to rest. Do you know how long I've waited for you in Kunlun? Do you understand how dearly I long for you to return? Just a short while before that. Before Katoblopas and Tinlos began their live stream. Hey, Enigma! I know you can hear me. Come out and show your face! Um, Tinlos? The Enigmas are all around us. I mean, they're not moving, but still. The two of them stand surrounded by a sea of Enigmas. Yet Tinlos seems to be ignoring that fact, shouting Enigmas main into the void. To hell with all these replicas! I'm looking for the original! Hey! Show your face already, you coward! I know you're not down here with all these fools. You have no reason to be involved in all this. You're made for the lost Akihabara Guildmaster, after all. You were his AI. And with him out of the picture, that means you've got nothing left to do, I'm betting. You can't leave the deep web, so what else are you gonna do, huh? You've got no choice but to wait. Well, you can't just sit here and wait forever. You have to do something. You have to chase after him. And we came to help you out, okay? We'll take over the search. We just need you to help out with this live stream first. You're the best at making things go viral. We need you if this stream's gonna be a successful one. I cannot refute any of what you said, Team Delos. I'll keep trying for promotional images for the video thumbnail. Can never have too many of those. I just finished one more picture myself. Now if we could just get the sh shilling fanfic crypto pass these out. At the crater's shared space, which doubles as the guild portal in Akihabara, the guild members are all working together to help support Katobu Pass's livestream. Whatever happened to their question to uh, Akia, though? Who? Hey, it's been a long time. I'm glad to hear you're okay. Listen, we need your help with the project we're working on. Really? So you can send your video editing equipment over to us? Fantastic! Yeah, right to the shared space, please. Hey, teach! Is it possible for you to send over the rest of the, your students? We need a lot of help right now! Oh, it's not an existence in this world. I mean, I guess we knew that from a shadow before. But we need something full screen for the insight! What's that? Oh yeah, of course I want you to come too! Is the avatar costume ready? Okay, beautiful. Can I have you send it straight to Tidalos? Oh, it sounds like a wonderful concept. You weren't called the Yucky Bar Fashionista for nothing. Fashionista is a no no word. Send my thanks to Musa, Pinam Moinen, and Kim Nara too, okay? It takes more than just the gathering of many talented individuals to make a successful piece of work. So many different opinions, tastes, and preferences are bound to form something incohesive, rough, and jarring if left unchecked. Those talented minds will simply bump into and clash with each other, creating something more messy than inspired. But Lian and Chi's rule is to tame and organize that fray, as if turning raw talent into perfect patchwork quilt. Whew! Okay! I've gotten all my contacts on board! 
Where's that key? I'm going though. Oh, he just left a moment ago. Said he was headed out to search for the guildmaster. <laughs> Things are gonna be okay, aren't they? Tell me they are, Katobo Pass. I heard about that stream, but I don't understand it all. It sounds like Athens is in deep trouble, though. There's no need to worry. As long as you can help us find the guildmaster, everything is gonna be just fine. We promised to find him in exchange for this guy named Enigma's help, so we'd really appreciate yours too. Yeah, I was kind of thinking. If you brought me in there, I could use my secret artifact to scout around. I was thinking the same thing, actually. The deep hub is connected to the app, so I figured your secret artifact could come in really handy. A Kyogangan's rule of extinguishing can calm the nerves of anyone distraught with agitation or hysteria. And since memories remain even after the app is cut off, this rule could help put out some of the lingering fires. Oh, with our first video. So we're both putting out fires from the first uh, video of us and our memories and uh, going to enhance uh, the distraction with Katopoplas. There is a vulnerability, however. According to Akiya Gangan, this power can only extinguish flames that he sees burning before his eyes. If any embers remain unseen, the inferno could be rekindled in an instant, and this could repeat endlessly until everything is alight. When someone's gone under the fire on a net, the flames of that controversy can flare up again just like that. That's exactly why I wanted to use your powers. This time, I don't want you to contain the fire, but rather the opposite. What? So, if I wouldn't be containing it, that means... Banning the flames. I want you to spread the fire as much as possible so we can burn everything in sight. You can't be serious. Oh. So, we're going to make everyone even more enraged at the Topo Pass. Okay, okay. I think I get where you're going with this. I'll probably be using the material you and I took together during the broadcast. But I want you to know, if things go wrong, you have to do your best to direct all the harm my way, and only my way, okay? What? No way! Why would you even suggest something like that? You're my friend, Katolapas. I can never let you take all the heat on your own. I'm always here to take some off your hands. I've had a lot of fun with you. Thank you, Akiha going in. You don't need me for anything. You never hesitate to call. You got that? Right then. Time to do my part. Akiya Gangan sets off alone on his mission. Okay. So according to Lian and Chi, someone should be meeting me here at any moment now. Hmm? Oh, Sonic, shit. Sorry to keep you waiting. No way, man! Another Crow Tengu! Are you one of Lord Onamuchi's messengers? Oh, wait. He goes by a different name down here. What was it again? Not Okuninushi. Lord Daikoku, maybe? Hmm. Ugh. Sorry, sorry. I should introduce myself. I'm Kahia Gongin, an avatar of Lord Onamuchi. I've been looking for him forever. Starting to wonder if he's even here in Tokyo at all, you know? Look, I've come here specifically to meet with you. Whether you come along with me or not is completely your decision. Hmm? You're my contact. Well now, I guess he must have gone a little ahead of himself, hasn't he? Sorry about that. Anyway, time to make some time for Teen Los. Clean? Dirty? Doesn't matter as long as you're all slaying it. Today, we're gonna be digging into a rumor that's been flooding the streets of Tokyo. You know what I'm talking about. And so, now I'd like to formally introduce you to my guests of today's show. Let's do this in Katovas. Gotta love that honky tonk. Well, hello again, in Katovas. I do cosplay in Akihabara. A flashy and colorful animated intro clip complemented by a fast and catchy theme song begins to play on the screen. We should have most of Tokyo's eyes on us now. Katobu Pass's body trembles uncontrollably with fear. He's regressing. He wants to hide his face. He struggles to keep his composure, but is teetering on the edge of succumbing to the mounting pressure. 
I'm still so, so scared. They just won't stop looking at me. I can feel their eyes drilling into my soul. But I'm not alone. This is nothing compared to what Arathon has been going through. The weight of the pressure on Katobupa's shoulders begins to lessen. His nervousness abates by about half. <laughs> Wait, come on, fight. <laughs> nice animation. Hey, can you hear me? Katobupa's! Yo, Katobupa's! It's normal to get nervous on your first livestream. No one's asking you to be a pro in the first go. An amateur is an amateur, and a pro is a pro. There's no need to overdo it. Me and the others will buy you some time. Just remember, nobody's watching this to judge you. They're watching for what you've got to say. So just let it all out. Don't hold back. Say what needs to be said. We're all rooting for you, dude. Ah. Uh. The screen in Katobu Pasa's hand cuts to Akihabara's shared space, where the guild members and her friends are all hard at work to produce the show. Music cues in as text lights up on the screen, introducing Tokyo's greatest team of creators. Katobu Pasa realizes he's not the only one being spotlighted here, and he begins to feel a bit humbled by the whole experience. Nonetheless, the pressure he feels is cut in half yet again, now that he knows just how many people have got his back. Breathe. Just breathe. He inhales, his body still trembling, and his voice is no doubt going to waver as well as soon as he opens his mouth to speak, but that's okay. Everyone, as you all know, there have been rumors spreading throughout Tokyo concerning a certain individual. These rumors suggest that this person is to blame for all the incidences happening of late. But that individual is my friend. We haven't been friends for very long, to be honest, but we are friends. There's a lot I don't know about him yet, but I still want you to hear what I have to say. The bottom line is, it's just not possible for one single person to be the cause of this city's problems. It's common sense. All you have to do is think logically for even a moment to realize how obvious that truth is. I want you to listen to what I have to say about the events in Tokyo and about Arthen. I know you all condemn him for what you think he did, but I have to set the record straight. So please, lend me your ears. Kotobu Pass begins to share everything that he and those around him know. He goes into detail about the game and its world representatives. As Teamless has repeatedly urged, he holds nothing back. Oh my gosh, so everyone's gonna know about us now. Not just the like highlight reel of that's obviously out to get against us, but like uh, pretty much the whole truth. Well, you know, as whole truth as uh, you know, hearsay can get. All right, that's your cue, Enigma. Let's make the stream go viral, not just in the deep web, but up on the surface too. Despite your isolated location, you can still clearly make out Katobupas' voice as it transmits through the deep web and beyond. Why would you leave? What purpose would it serve? Despite the one you sought to rescue showing you such hatred, such malice... There's more to it than that. There's another reason. There must be. I just don't know what it is yet. I told you what's waiting beyond this haven. The world representatives wish to do you harm. Yet despite knowing the danger that awaits you, you still insist upon leaving. My friends are still fighting. I have to go help them. They need me. There's still a lot I don't understand, but... On that last point, we can agree. Why won't you understand the gravity of the situation? You are safe here, and only here. No. Step aside, Fushi. I'm leaving this place. If that's how it's to be, then you leave me no choice. I'll show you in detail just what awaits beyond the sanctuary. Once you know, I'm certain you'll change your tune. One of the talismans orbiting Fushi's bodies expands into another phantom image, putting itself out in front of you to block your exit. To put it simply, that which exists within you has expanded and flipped everything on its head. The Enigmas got their hands on the second fragment of Kiyoma Monobe and used that version of him to unlock your secrets. And with those secrets now laid bare, your own value has been dramatically undermined. Alright, let's just do the thingy where we do this. Don't hurt us! 
Okay, that wasn't too bad. Oh my god, no. He has blowback. That's not good. Uh, okay. Let's uh, just push ourselves all the way to the front, I guess. Uh, oh wait, never mind. Fucking not long enough range to go up. Wait, what happened to range? Did he remove our buff? I think he did. Well, as long as we're not hitting him. Actually, what happens if we hit him? Let's see. <laughs> Whatever. He actually got camped out from that one hit. Well, it doesn't look like anything happens on him, but still, there's not really any reason to them since he's not really taking enough damage for anything. No! I don't really need you, Nomad. Goodbye. Oh, whoops, I hit him. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> he didn't really do anything when I hit him either. I don't get Well, whatever. It's a survival quest. Oh my gosh, that's so much coin! I should have brought coin boosters! God damn it. The world representatives are those who stand atop their respective world's beliefs and hierarchies. They are the main players competing for the game's trophy. The reason they are regarded as such? Because they are the only ones who can truly cause harm to you. Uh huh? In their home worlds, they have already established their hierarchies. So as they stand at the top of this other world, hierarchies yet to be set here in Tokyo, they represent the only true threats to you. The sole condition for being a player in a game like this, after all, is the ability to stand in the way of other players. Those who do not stand in the way, those who present no threat, no obstacle, can never truly be seen as players. Let me ask you a question. Could you feel Smoky God's earnest intent? He wanted to save you. He said as much again and again and again. But then it all changed. He came here to kill you. Do you understand why? You swing your sword at Fushi, but he evades the attack with ease. He smiles and continues his speech. By the time our battle took place, he had discarded all his thoughts and affection towards you. He tried to make excuses on account of the one within you known as Asura, but all that fell by the wayside in the end. He must never again forget who the world representatives are and the threat to you that they engender. They identify and exile those who they feel are proven threats to their societies. And emotions toward the exile run particularly high within the invaders guild to which I belong. Take the representative of Xanadu, supreme ruler of the Great Plains, who banished his sworn friend, Jamuka. Or the representative of Kitez, supreme ruler of the Great Tundra, who exiled the poetry-loving lord of the underworld, Belis. Or the representative of Shangri-La, who watched in silence as a traitorous former friend he called Asura fell to the realm of strife. Hey, it's them. These representatives have all seen someone they know within you. Someone they've previously taken down. I wonder how their existence will work out with their regular counterparts. I thought that they would eventually transform, or at least they'd show up first before these guys were revealed, but guess not. Their banishment of that someone is akin to a ritualistic sacrifice for the betterment of the worlds they represent. Each of the worlds is like an organism that struggles within itself for a single, dominant will to embrace. And the world representatives carry that collective will, that belief, upon their backs. 
That is why they are able to justify brutality on a grand scale. It is not for someone they've only just met, but for the idea that person represents. The idea you represent. That is what it means to be a representative and carry the burden of something so grand as a world in its faith. There is absolutely nothing that comes before this responsibility. No personal laments can compare. Most of this isn't news to me. So what's the point you're trying to make? The conditions for being the trophy require that you not be a player within the game. The 23 souls within you are exiles from the 23 worlds, each notably lower in hierarchy than the world representatives. And the game was established because, when push comes to shove, it can be played anytime and in any way. Hierarchy, huh? But that assumption, that preconception, has been shattered now. Or rather, everyone has now become aware of its falsity. There is something else inside of you though. Small, but significant. What's inside of me? Hmm? <laughs> Who among you is asking, I wonder? Oof, getting meta. The fact that we world representatives were ignorant of the truth is, frankly, not surprising in the least. We possess powers that stand at the pinnacle of our hierarchies. We can see the future, destroy societies, obliterate stars. You possess the power of the 23 heroes, which makes you the natural enemy of us representatives. But there is something else as well. Something incomparable, small, and unique. It has not come from any of the 23 worlds, nor from this Tokyo. So the question becomes, from whence does it hail? We world representatives have mulled over this for a long time now. We originally believed it was only the 23 heroes banished to Tokyo who are manipulating the vessel that is your body. We considered someone else may be in the mix, but we were certain that if so, they ranked at the bottom of our hierarchies. But in this current loop, we had the opportunity to see your memories for the first time and understood that we were wrong. Oh, so... I know there's a lot of uh, those romance situations in this game where they say they see us for our true selves as well as our past lives. Um, but in this case, it seems that we, uh, this other self, has been underestimated all this time um, as something that didn't have power in the first place. Perhaps they assumed it was just a Tokyo resident or something. But here he's claiming that um, this individual, this small thing, is not from Tokyo and is actually um, significant in the sense that Perhaps it's because we have the power to change who we are as, uh, on birth, unlike everyone else. Someone has chosen your body to be their vessel. This was not the will of the vessel, but another existence altogether. And this should not be. Smoky God said so as well. One does not choose the body into which they are born. It's an unprecedented occurrence to customize the vessel through which one interacts with the world. So this is actually a brand new threat that uh, is actually uh, completely unfamiliar with all of the world representatives and hence why they perceive us as an actual threat now rather than as uh, some insignificant uh, outlier. And one mustn't assume the 23 heroes had a say in the matter either, as no doubt each would choose their own original body given the option. Ah. So it can only be concluded that there is the will of a 24th within you. Someone apart from the 23 worlds in Tokyo alike. This someone cannot fly, nor part the earth or the oceans, nor manipulate gravity. This being likely isn't even able to wield a sword under normal circumstances, let alone engage in battle. But somehow, this being must be influencing your actions, telling you where to go and what to do. Even if only faintly, I pray now and again to direct the decisions you make through the three options that you pick that don't actually matter in the story. I have no clue from whence it has come, nor for what reason, but I can say this. This mysterious being that comes not from the 23 worlds, nor from Tokyo, stands firmly outside all known hierarchies. The world representatives would all be able to tell innately if you ranked somewhere beneath them. And they cannot allow for anyone or anything which threatens to quash their fates or halt the continuity of their societies. In all the loops thus far, the possibility of such an existence had never once come to bear. 
But now that it has, the future is uncertain, and the only way to retain the status quo is to silence you. You are a danger that cannot be ignored. You threaten the very fabric of the 23 worlds. I mean, to choose your own identity is quite impossible. Um, I don't mean in the sense of choosing your own identity after birth, but I mean choosing your own identity before birth. <laughs> that is very significant. It's uh, what, uh, you know, <laughs> transforms who we are, where we're born, how we perceive things. It essentially lets you become anyone and everyone if, uh, at that point if you have that power. And true, in truest sense, not just in like um, mentally or, you know, uh, by hormones, <laughs> uh, not just not just mentally but also physically and in every other sense. A world representative in particular can certainly cannot look the other way. It is our duty to keep our world safe and secure. We can only put aside our personal qualms, take down the threat that we perceive, and banish it from our worlds. There is no longer any possibility of you returning once again to any of your homelands. You are an enemy to all world representatives. They. We will banish you time and uh, again for as long as we must. So you too. Why haven't you turned against me? Ah, uh, me. I saw you'd never ask. <laughs> I couldn't care less about the continuation of the world. In my face, that is but a trivial matter. Even should the world end or any number of people be erased, that is of no concern. The only thing I need is you, my dear sister. Merely living here, together with my beloved little sister, is enough for me. Uh. What happened with your sister exactly? Was she lower than you on the hierarchy? Did you perhaps abandon her? Comments from viewers of Katobopas' livestream start flooding into the deep web, displaying in the corners of his vision. There are comments of warm support and comments of encouragement. But unsurprisingly, there's no shortage of slanderous flames filled with hate as well. Those comments stand out from the rest, and they scare Katobopas. They hurt him. But Katobopas maintains a brave face and continues talking. Because... Or whatever negative attention he might be getting from certain corners of the web, this is still his stream, and people are still choosing to watch him. He has the full backing of Team Los and the others, who provide visuals and music to entice the users and an unmatched production support. The cards are very much in Katoplopas' favor. Eh, we're going to be out of material soon. Isn't there anything more we can do to make a bigger impact? Huh? What's this? A tip from a viewer? Eh? Wait, is this for real? So you say Yatsufusa had ties with your guild. And he wishes for me to find happiness, despite being neither my true father nor my adoptive one. What relevance does that have? Did you truly come all this way just to deliver such a pointless message to me? Wait, was he talking about some other false father? Not uh, Yat Ashino all this time? Yeah, I guess I can't really expect you to take the words of someone you've never met to heart. And it isn't exactly an earth-shattering message or anything. But it's kind of hypocritical to dismiss something like this so easily, then go on and talk about final sacrifices and all that. Hmm. What are you entertaining this sassy little girl for, Masanori? We should just crush them all and get this over with. I could obliterate her skull with one swing of my giant base, or my name isn't Falseslav. Yes, yeah, she's sassy, but she is my sassy suit, and you're not to lay a finger upon her. Oh ho, do you wish to eat my mace instead? Well, be my guest, old man. You call yourself Falseslav. It is a name I know all too well. I fought with them numerous times in my homeland of Kites, but you are not the same werewolf. 
Who are you? Hmm. You are not who you claim to be. Not in form, figure, or finesse. So I'll ask you again. Who are you? Well, I'd love to stay and see this touching teacher-student drama through its climax. It's time for the final act. You are already caught within the spider's web. There's nothing left to do but wait for your inevitable end. Spider's web, you say? Yeah, it suits me just fine, since the spider's web ha has set many holes in which a clever bug can escape. Your name is Elia, right? Yeah, my thanks for buying us this much time. What? Your arm? What happened to your arm? Ah, uh, that's right. I remember now just what made you such a cunning and remarkable foe, Sande you. Back in the intelligence room where Sande you had corralled by Wolf, a, disem a dismembered arm freely floats into the air, operating a terminal containing classified information. Uh, with what eyes are you reading this, by the way? <laughs> the arm finds a document detailing a strategic alliance with the Invaders Guild, as well as one containing all manners of secret intelligence pertaining to the agents. The arm continues to come through the documents, all the while broadcasting the entire procedures through a live feed. But for real, how is he doing this without Isaac? <laughs> I was able to dig some real juicy contents for the viewers at home thanks to all this downtown. Sunday is missing arms, comes floating in through the giant hole blown out by Fulf and reattaches itself to his body. What? No! You couldn't have! Oh, but I did. I leaked all your little secrets to the open public through a handy little tool I like to call a live stream. The top ninja of the Eager Clan, Sandayu Momochi, is an expert at breaking down the links which sustain society through interception of intelligence. In this way, he always stays one step ahead of his opponent, specifically by determining and exploiting that to which said opponent is most averse. Ugh. Answer me, Fushi. Or does it pain you too much to say? Ugh. Well, I'm taking my leave. Thank you for your concern, but goodbye. You stop right there. I'm not letting you get away from me again. I said don't move! The Game of Revolution Part 3. Battle. Uh, defeat Fushi. S uh, wait, why is it? Oh, I see. It's gonna be a... <laughs> defeat only Fushi. And uh, we have a bunch of dragons as well as Fushi. And... This is taking place in a large map. Oh, and the reward is coin. I'm remembering to bring my coins apart this time. You better believe it. I have a distinct feeling that uh, Guts might be involved in this, so I will just go ahead and bring the Guts Reversal AR. Let us do this. I am your older sibling. I was born before you. You came after me. You are second to me. In time, fate always took its course and the world always fell to ruin. We siblings would be the only ones who remained. I would gaze upon you and resolve to protect you. This was to become my purpose in life. My life itself. I could see into the future. I saw the future and all that it would bring. The world would be born anew and would end anew, again and again. I saw it all unfold, first in my visions, and then in reality. I understood its patterns, like the blinking of an eye. It's as if I were viewing all creation and destruction through a macro lens. That is how the world and its wonders eventually faded into banality for me. There was no splendor anymore. Everything was sepia. You are the only exception, my sister. You are the only element I could never predict or understand. You are the only one who can move my heart. Information submitted from anonymous users is displayed behind where Katopopa stands, and he now speaks to just one person. Despite having gathered the attention of a great majority of Tokyo, 
He appears unshaken, the former tremble in his voice completely gone. One would be forgiven for some degree of panic when addressing such an extraordinarily large number of people, for stumbling over one's words or showing hesitation or uncertainty. But though multitudes are glued to his every syllable, Katobalpas is paying no heed to them. He's trying, as best as he can, to make his words heard by one very specific set of ears. Is Katobalpas singling in on one particular viewer? I believe he is. And I suspect the guildmaster you want so desperately to meet will have something to say in response. The Akihabara guildmaster is, after all, the kind of person who typically shows himself before all up and coming creators. There's no way someone of his proclivities can possibly ignore what's happening here, with the collaboration of all the creators, of course. I can't understand why, Tindalos. In what way does this Katopopas differ from me? I've always driven to provide the ultimate satisfaction to the singular person in my charge. So, why? Enigma, having been created specifically to fill the very role Katopopas seems to be excelling at, struggles to comprehend how this transient is achieving such success so readily. To Enigma's artificial mind, it very much seems as if Enigma is being beaten at its own game, so to speak. Yet by its very nature, that shouldn't be possible. Eh, I'm not really sure how to explain it. Guess you can say it's kind of an enigma. I'm killing you for that. So, someone else then. Not my real father, nor my adoptive father. He must be talking about spiritual father, Yatsufusa. Do you have some history with this Yatsufusa? Not especially. I only really spoke with him a few times. Ali puts her hand to her chest and recalls how she felt during those times. Her encounters with the Canisterian had stirred something within her, though she struggles to put it into words. It's as if some small piece of him remained embedded in her mind. Perhaps it's the fact that she too has been called many names and been on the receiving end of so much unwarranted attention that makes her feel a certain kinship with him. Some have called her a cold-blooded beast, a selfish nightwalker. Others regard her more positively as a famous high school model or the queen of Kabukicha. All are accurate descriptions in their own way, but none ever quite touched upon the real Ellie. Beneath the surface, there is an identity no one but Yatsufusa has ever even glimpsed. Well, we just talked, but somehow, that alone is enough. It stirred something in me. And that something is what motivated me to take action. You've always been the only one who could make my heart stir. Therein lies the conflict. Why don't you understand me? Why won't you just listen to your big brother? And therein lies the anger. Why must you persistently go down to that world where everyone ridicules and despises you? Are you crying or are you angry? No. No, 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 no. He seems to have gone over the edge. He can't even form coherent thoughts now. He's lost in his anger and sorrow, but there's something else as well. He doesn't know how to express his true feelings. He can't properly convey the pain he's endured for so long. Why must you continue to suffer for the sake of a world that only seeks to harm you? Why must you run from me? I love you more than anyone in that world ever could. Why am I no good to you? I don't have all the answers, but my friends are calling for me. I have to go to them. I'm sorry. Don't you dare leave. Don't you dare leave me. Don't even think of defying the will of your big brother. There's nothing I wouldn't do for your love. No, wait. That's not what I wanted to say. The younger sibling must always obey the older sibling. No. That's not it either. His words don't quite come out the way he wants them to. No matter how many times he tries, he suddenly realizes that this is how it's always been. Why? Why? Holy shit. 
The dragon veins, almost as if in response to Fushi's anxiety and frustration, begin to rumble. His raw emotions ride upon the currents and fill the entire space. His inner conflict has begun raging outward, like a torrential storm forming in a bottle. A little something deep within Fushi begins to scream, louder and louder, until it escapes his body and manifests before your very eyes. Please, don't leave me! Finally, he pleads. He speaks the words he somehow could never formulate before, laying bare his own deepest innermost desire. <sighs> Defeat Fushi. I wonder if that glimpse of uh, Waka Mugen and Tangaroa Mugen were visible once uh, chapter was first released. Because that means their art had to be finished well before chapter 12 prologue was released. Um, I have no idea what all these effects are, but they are infinite, so there's no point in trying to remove them, I suppose. Um, well, unless they are removable. Uh, but no one can remove anything, so I'm just gonna have to deal. Can't really seem so fine so far, so... I think I just saw Rage. Uh-oh. Uh, he's getting CP a bit fast. I don't like that. <laughs> I hope we can <laughs> beat him before that happens, whatever he charges. Is he healing? I think he is healing. From when we attacked him. Is he only, uh, like, taking damage on the second hit? That might be it, but... but there's a gimmick to this, I have no idea what it is. <laughs> Um, okay, if he's healing from every second hit, maybe we should just back off with Anbari. But yeah, it seems he does take reduced damage. Um, oh no, he's not healing, it's just... Sing. Oh man, I should've just kept on hitting him with Anbari. I wasted a good charge. And no one has CP reduction. This is a sad thing. Uh, I want to eliminate him. Um, I'm not sure if it's enough damage at this point. Unless... Goodbye, infinite buffs. Still long enough. No! They're not like... Let's call it something that makes it impossible to beat. Let's stack up, whatever. That will be fine. Unless he starts not taking damage with words. Really suck. Hey, we did it. Maybe. There you go. How much win is that? Ooh, that's good, that's good. Oh wait, never mind, it's just- uh, whatever. The previous one gave more coin. Come on! Come on! Oh well. Katobopas continues to speak from his heart as well. The words float from his mouth as naturally as the air he breathes. He is surprised by his own eloquence and forthrightness, and wonders where the side of him has been all this time. He considers his two sides further. He who always keeps his head down and avoids the gaze of others, and he who cosplays. Which one is the real Katobalpas? He's been asking himself the same question for a long time. But now he realizes that maybe neither option quite fits the bill. Whichever side he considers, he always feels as though something's missing. There's the Katobalpas who keeps his head down, the Katobalpas who cosplays, and another as well. The theme of three, continuing. Clutching his knees in the dark, sitting in the fetal position, seen by no one, and no one calling his name. So much has happened since that fateful day when I first met Arathan. I never knew I could laugh and smile like that. 
Man, we really became good friends with Kotobopas in this chapter. I wonder if he's gonna stick around permanently, because like, Jesus Christ. He, he might as well be a summoner with how close he got with us at this point. I never knew I could get angry like that either. Oh, where are you now? What are you doing there? Is my voice reaching you? The things you want to keep hidden have been exposed. I can only imagine how disheartened you must feel. Or maybe you're putting on a brave front, quivering under the weight of it all, but standing firm nonetheless. Maybe quaking in anger, but continuing to push forward anyway. Whatever may be the case, I'm sure there's more to it than I could ever really know. A lot more. But no matter how much I may say here, I feel like my words aren't quite going to reach all of you. Much like there's a part of me I never knew about, I'm convinced there's a part of you you never knew about too. I'm a tiny bit worried of uh, the method he chose, but I'm gonna assume it'll be fine this time, but... My worries stem from the fact that in Shinjuku Dungeon, we attempted a similar strategy. Well, it's not Katobo Boss's time in here, but what happened was uh, we revealed the truth to a bunch of people of what happened, um, and that actually caused the end of the world by causing everyone to go crazy with uh, everyone expecting the end of the world. Um, in this case, our, all of our memories have been revealed, uh, and, you know, that's on top of the truth that compounded from, you know, uh, the game in terms of our like a contribution to it, but now that they've seen our memories, we know, or rather, everyone should know the truth that it's just a looping thing that is rigged to begin with, and that it's not necessarily our fault, and, um, I don't know, uh, that, that's very similar to what happened with the Shinjuku Dungeon story anyways, but uh, we'll just have to see. You have your own advent- you have your own another within you, and I'm not sure I have to address that part of you, which is very frustrating. No matter what I call it, no matter how much effort I exert, it won't be enough. But I want to reach that part of you so much. If you are finally able to grasp this other part of you, if you can just touch that another within you. And if what we're creating now can reach it. Arachne and Itzamna will remain faceless. I want you to grab hold of it. I want the other that resides within you to have what we're making. If not now, then someday. <laughs> it's no use. I'm no match for a world representative. For all your best efforts, you are still bound by the established hierarchy. You cannot overcome Fushi's rule. Okay, so I understand now. Uh, the rules the rules that have been established in our previous role, they mentioned this briefly, I didn't comment on it, but the hierarchy had already been established between us versus the role representatives, which explains why we can never attack them. Um, <laughs> I feel like maybe Tess said that, but I'm having a hard time remembering. Um, but this is a good reminder, I suppose. It is as if you are given a rule of losing. Oh, <laughs> ouch. Your rule of running simply has no effect on him. Just have to use double dragon. Come on out, little Solomon. No! Let's put a stop to this fuss now, before it's too late. Fuji places his hand over yours and gently lowers your sword. It needn't come to this. I'll accept my loss here today. Dear sister. Huh? But why? I no longer wish to stand idly by and watch you continue to get hurt. I finally understand what I must do, or what I should have been doing all along. And I think I finally understand why it is that you left me. What? Fushi's body begins to glow, and that glow gradually expands upward into the pillar of light. Frankly, I was expecting him to disappear in the next chapter or something, because that seems to be a trend, as I saw us in uh, chapter 8, and then two more reps after that in, in sequence, in their own chapters, with uh, Shiva and Tuskalipoka in chapter 10 and 11. And I, uh, we already just lost Smoking God, are we gonna lose Fushi 2 in the same chapter? God damn, this is going fast, Gurren was right. You were right. I've been looking down on you this entire time.
I should have said something sooner. I should have pleaded with you not to leave me. But I can never blame myself to. I was supposed to know everything about the world after all. There shouldn't have been anything beyond my understanding. And yet... <laughs> I never even fully understood myself, did I? You must have realized it, how I looked down upon you so. That's why. That's why you left me. <sighs> Though Fushi is simply expressing his own theories, he feels a sense of certainty in his words. Because the hierarchy between you two remain undetermined, you default to equals upon it, and equals are not bound by any restrictions. Even killing isn't off the table. Yet all this time, he regarded you not as his equal, but as lower than him. And since he didn't consider his sister to be his equal, it stands to reason she didn't consider him to be her equal either. So of course she would leave, who would willingly stay with someone who looks down upon them. Who could stand to remain in the presence of someone who refuses to respect them as an equal? It's just... So frustrating. Why do I have such trouble finding the right words? I never meant to look down on you. No. That's not it. However I may have seen you, my love for you never once faltered. No. That's not it either. Whatever he's trying to say, something completely different seems to keep coming out. I'd always loved you, dear sister. With all of my heart. More than anyone else. How perfectly trite. Fushi laughs at the sound of his own voice, uttering such nonsense. I wanted so much to protect you from harm. Genuinely. That's what I always wanted. The Fushi who always prided himself on knowing all there is to know of heaven and earth, finally accepting his shortcomings. Just doing his best to convey his feelings in simple language. Yet, in the end, the one who hurt you the most was me. I'm so sorry. I want to address the other within that body. Can you hear me? Are my words getting through to you as well? I know you're in there, and I finally understand what a blessing it is that you are. I, who created this Bagua that delimits and classifies the fundamental elements of the world, now finally understand. You're an additional and crucial keystone mixed in among those 23 heroes gathered together from so many disparate worlds. You represent something miraculously rare and singular. It is through providence alone that I can speak with you. But this opportunity is no doubt a fleeting one. Before long, we will certainly part ways. You could leave this world at any time. In fact, for you are not bound to it like the others are, like I am. Yet you remain in this vessel, stand before me. Why? Oh, well, because Hosman was a fun game. Perhaps you were driven by something which simply cannot be put into words. Much like the other 23 heroes from within that body, in that sense. But you are different from them. You do not possess the ability to manipulate space, gravity, or dreams. Perhaps you will lament the fact that you cannot enact miracles like the 23 souls who share that body with you. Oh yeah, ain't that the truth. But bear in mind, you exist outside of this world's hierarchy. You are not part of its system. You may be offering yourself to it, for all I know, but you have not yet succumbed to its effects. And that's good. Because what you do have is far more precious than any of our so-called miracles. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> you are from a world beyond the scope of my knowledge or nothing is set in stone, or anything is possible. And I hope that in that world, in some capacity, you are smiling, and perhaps one day, we can smile together. May we meet again, somewhere, someday, somehow. Mephistopheles, I understand that you wanted to brief me on the recent chain of events. 
But surely you didn't just mean to have me show off my orb to the rulemaker's guildmaster, did you? Yeah, that's, actually that's true. <laughs> what the heck? Tanatomo, bearer of the Orb of Wisdom, confronts Mephistopheles over the recent meeting with Kern. Of course not. The terms I have for victory are a bit different from those of the other representatives. Hmm. You will very soon be playing an indispensable role in that. For the time being, I simply thought that it best we deepen our bonds. Kinda sus. Though that orb of yours will soon expose the grand contradiction in the system of this world, I dare say. The contradiction of Tokyo? I fear that you may be putting too much faith in me. Just what is it you're trying to do? Hmm. Did I ever tell you of the time I took part in a certain game with a certain omniscient, omnipotent individual? He has a direct connection to Solomon, I suppose. The goal of the game was to serve, seduce, and corrupt an ordinary human. Curious, isn't it? That an omniscient, omnipotent being should even wish to play games at all, much less one so debased. Of course, I had no idea what their motivations actually were, but I do have my theories. I believe there are some intangible things even the omniscient don't know. And I believe this being was studying them. And that, I think, is this world system. It is the final contradiction. This game exists to find answers. Hmm? This system is built around those in this world who are deemed valuable. Those whose names hold some weight. Those who represent that which the all-knowing could not know. They are small and insignificant, but intriguing in their mystery. Between Chino and Duno, what could this mean? And though it is but my humble opinion, I feel those seemingly insignificant mortals may hold the key to a breakthrough. A night of fierce conflict passes, giving way to a brand new day. Uh, at this point, the spread of intel should have far outpaced all expectations, to the point of becoming problematic. I suspect the guildmasters of both the invaders and creators are busy putting out the fires now. Seeing as how this strategy will only prove viable up to a certain point in time, and that point is fast approaching. X day the point in every loop when transients and app users in Tokyo finally outnumber ordinary citizens. So there's a name for it now, x day The invaders, one of the three true guilds, have already accepted one of the game masters into its fold. And since the game masters have the ability to control memory, it's something of a given that m most current events will find themselves being conveniently forgotten. Huh? Alright, I think we're supposing here that uh, San Kumara may have betrayed the Game Masters uh, and that is now using his memory wiping skills uh, in order to further the invaders' goals. Although the invaders always did seem to have the ability to manipulate memory in some way anyways. In the very least, they seem to be able to uh, foment fears among the crowd and uh, stoke those fires to go towards some direction, but at least that was uh, what Leaked was saying. Uh, Leaked was suspecting, at least with the help of Toji, uh, that someone among them has infiltrated their ranks and could control and manipulate memory. I presume that was you know, invaders at first, but maybe he's not actually referring to invaders, but uh, someone more specific, among, rather someone among the Game Masters. I suppose that was the Revolutionary Prodigy's plan all along. The Invader's Guildmaster has achieved his primary goal of exposing the trophy's memories through representatives, after all. That was his goal. I thought his goal was to... Uh, right, he didn't actually, inf as a matter of fact, take the ring. That was Curran's goal. But Isaac, presumably through, you know, an enigma, uh, didn't actually remove it. All he did was just expose everyone's memories. So, that also makes sense of what Fushi was, uh, was waiting for as well. He was waiting for that moment so that he can justify our protection it's all coming together which means there shouldn't be much further disturbance from then for the time being things should begin to calm down any moment now and another hiatus should come out until the release of chapter 13 prologue 
All that's needed is to wait for the flames to be extinguished. Dune knows it's merely the calm before the storm, however, as the next step is going to be the prodigies turning against one another. Oh, he's aware of even that much. Well, I suppose if he knows what, what uh, Isaac is doing, then he, <laughs> he should know that he already made the first moves toward the trail. I am kind of uh, shocked that Duo would know, though, since he's kind of been here chilling with Bertrand the entire time. It'll be a struggle for survival with those who've already surpassed him from the very start. He can't help but try to calculate what little chance he has of coming out on the other side of such a battle royale. I'm just Plan D. I'm the reserve, waiting my turn in the shadow of the other three. But I'll show them. I'll show them that there's another answer in this game, beyond just three choices. Morning, huh? Looks like we've somehow managed to hold them off. Oh yeah, good thing too, because I'm as beat as they come. Thought we were done for back there. Sunday cracks his neck and readjusts his arm as he muses on their victory. His statement is a bit facetious, however, as he knows the two of them were never in any real danger. I think things are all wrapped up here now. So the big question is, what's next? Sunday thinks for a moment about the terms of Smokey God's assignment for him. I mean, he's already gone now. Very sad one-sided disappearance. I'm entrusting you to protect the target from afar at all costs, no matter how dire the circumstances or fearsome the foe. Kind of sad the irony that he ends up being the one who tried to kill us in the end. You may use any methods at your disposal, provided you can help ensure the target continues to lead a healthy student life. The job will last until I directly advise you of its termination, and you'll receive regular payments via wire transfer. I mean, he did say he's rich. So it seems that, um, yeah, due to the fact that Smokey is no longer into play and unable to change these orders, uh, and also unable to redirect these transfers, it seems that Sandyu will now be our permanent teacher to take care of us and uh, watch our lives. Holy! Well, that's a lot of zeros. <laughs> Suffice it to say, I'm in. <laughs> For that much money, Sandy thought, he'd like the Smoky God Shell's shoes clean if he had to. <laughs> Let us be clear, however. You are not to abandon this assignment, even if you never hear a word from me again. Did Smoky God know? Or at least have an idea of what could happen? I do have one question on that note. Say your payments suddenly stop coming in because you've run out of cash or something. I retain a wealth large enough to purchase 12 palaces and 10,000 monuments in Tokyo without losing a single figure. But I suppose after several thousand years, the money may run out. In that case too, you may consider your job finished. <laughs> Santa, you rolling in that dirt. <laughs> Ugh. Wait, he's still alive? <laughs> I barely have the energy to move even one finger. Yes, I am still here. <laughs> Actually, now I think about it, we never saw any desummoning lights. <laughs> Smoky God remembers to himself as he gazes upon Kunlun's landscape gradually vanishing from his sight. It was his duty as world representative of Shangri-La to subdue Asura, who he perceived was poised to destroy the world. It was for the world's sake that he took the actions he did. He was to set an example for others, in the name of his deep-seated faith. He also intended to contact the ninja Sandayu to inform him that the existing contract was to be not only annulled, but also reversed, where his charge was now the enemy. <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> about that. But Smoky God no longer has the power to fulfill any of this. Things did not go according to plan after all. Yeah, it seems that's the case. <laughs> Just as he couldn't save his old friend back then, so too has he failed in his mission now. <laughs> mm. <laughs> How many times has he ridden upon the tracks of this recurring leap? Well, he has can't. It's been at least 5,670,000,000. Whatever the exact number, it's far too many for a mere human. Perhaps the time has come for him to finally attain Nirvana in this world. I always thought you'd follow in my footsteps and accompany me on my journey. I'd hope you would escape the path of endless strife and find your way to the Pure Land with me. But it was not to be, because I inflicted countdown on myself for some reason. 
We dwell in two separate worlds. You shall continue onwards to a place I know nothing of. It makes me so sad. And yet, so happy. But this shall not be our final parting. May our paths cross again somehow. Someday, somewhere. Perhaps when I get my variant. Farewell until we meet again in that eternal paradise. <laughs> If he's human, then I guess he was never summoned in Tokyo, so he just dies. Damn. Damn! Oh my god. Okay, we had de summonings, but we never had outright deaths like here in Tokyo that remained dead. <laughs> Holy shit. Ah, hey there. Sounds like you're a little out of sorts, Sarzen. <laughs> you remember my voice, I trust. It's time to you, your new homeroom teacher. Get your number from your emergency contact file. Am I okay? And the rest of the class? Yeah, we're hanging in there. Don't you worry. Sonny you kept some covert surveillance active within the academy, and glances over at it to make sure that this is an accurate assessment. Fortunately, it is. Did everyone forget about whatever happened to us? It seems the biggest incident in recent memory was, in fact, the throngs of students who chased you away. Which only stands to reason, as what else could have possibly been expected to occur there once you were gone? Still getting everybody to slow down after your ousting, but things died back down real quick. On that note, you've had quite an oust at this point. I trust you'll be coming back to class before too long, right? Time for another hiatus here. If you're worried, you know you can always come see me. I'll even accompany you to class if it'll make you feel better. <laughs> uh, so you considers the long-term nature of this contract he signed up for with Smoky God. Once you've returned, it's literally his duty to ensure that you have a healthy school life. But it's also imperative that Sandio not blow his cover, so he needs to play the teacher role to a T. All of this means that there's a long mission ahead of him, no matter what. Uh, I wonder what it was like for that Mononobi guy before me. Teaching sure is harder than people make it out to be, isn't it? Indeed. Teaching can be more of a battle than an actual battle. Never did I imagine you and I might commiserate about it, though. Huh? Wait, where did that Ellie girl run off to? She darted off the moment the bell was won. I tell you, these young kids have too much energy. It's impossible to keep up. Yeah! <laughs> You've got your hands full as well, I see. You know, why don't we grab a drink before the trains start running? Ah, uh, they're frenemies. Congratulations, everybody! We did it! I'm so tired, but I feel so accomplished. It's like when I stayed up all night writing that magic book. Let's say we throw ourselves a closing party. After everyone else has gotten back, of course. Meaning, we should probably plan it for another day and get some rest now. I'll coordinate with the others, though. Hmm. Everyone, may I have your attention, please? Is she going to reveal that she's part of the entertainers? Huh? Man and she, what's up? I just, uh... I've got this thing I need to do, so I have to go now. But when I get back, um... Let's throw that closing party, and let's make it a big one. I'll be more than happy to do the producing. Oh, I guess not. Just... Wait for me before you do any party planning, if you would. Is that... okay? Uh, are you kidding me, Energy? Of course not! Of course we'll wait for you. Good luck with whatever it is you're doing. I'll be back before you know it. Looks like she's going to be coordinating with uh, Sanit again. Although Sanit's supposed to be with uh, Akiha right now. Oh, there he is. Look, I've come here specifically to meet with you. Whether you come along as me or not is completely your decision. Huh? You're my contact. Hey, there's the other Tengu. Whoa now, hold the phone there, hot stuff. It's never a good idea to go around following strangers you only just met. You don't want to make the cops for it now, do you? <laughs> no way! Another crow, Tengu! What's going on? You're so much older, too. Well, that's not very nice. I'll have you know I could take the two of you brats at the same time if I wanted, in more ways than one. But I must say, this one does look strikingly like me when I was his age. Perhaps he's the one. Hmm. 
see, there have been numerous reports of people seeing someone in Akihabara impersonating me of late. I owe a debt of gratitude to that girl who brought this to my attention. You have my thanks, Lian and Chi. A betrayal? What? And you have mine! You cute and scruffy officer, you! <laughs> Wait, she actually likes him. I, I mean, I respect it. I would have caught you in time, the Kyogonian. You mustn't follow that man under any circumstances. Lien and Chi? Wait, but you're the one who sent me here to meet with them, aren't you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry I tried to trick you, but it's all over now. I made him time to stop you, thankfully. You certainly did, Jesus. It is true that this person has some connection with that Koku. But if you should accompany him, you'd stand to lose who you are. Lian and Chi of the Entertainers, is this a betrayal? Or are you betraying me, Sana Kumar of the Game Masters, despite our long history together? There's a thought. How could I betray you, after all, when you are not the Sana Kumar I know? What? Is this Daikoku's clone? The Sana Kumar I know is clumsy and stubborn, but endlessly kind and shines like a diamond. You are not he. Hmm. We've been partnered for so very long that betrayal is the last thing I'd ever want to do. I just can't bring myself to believe that you changed. But it's written in their name. The invaders. They invade the hearts of others that change them at their very core. So I reiterate, you are not Son Kumar. You've just cloaked yourself in his shadow. I don't know the person you've become. But I want the Son and I, Kumar I know back. Please, give him back to me. I beg of you. They invade the heart and change the soul. They are a guild of aggression and revolution. They watch from the darkest shadows as this battle took place in Akihabara. They always watch from the highest vantage points and from deep below the surface of the ocean alike. They stand beyond the infinite loops, weighing down the very finite vessels at their disposal. Weighing down their vessels? So. Are they saying that these are, as a matter of fact, true, the true bodies of Tangaroa and Wakan? They are the world representatives of the invaders. Their names are Wakan Tanka and Tangaroa. Here ends the overture of another new conflict. The true invasion and accompanying revolution are now close at hand. Chapter 12 Invaders, Overture, The Game of Revolution, End. Oh! Alright, we did it! Chapter 12, Finito. So, there was a lot more than I expected for Chapter 12, aka not the actual final chapter of the Invaders, but we learned quite a big deal um, of what we are. Uh, it seems we're getting a bit meta in terms of there is a player behind uh, the individual that is Arthur or whatever you decide to name your protagonist. On top of that, it seems the world representatives will now continue as uh, hostiles towards us, not necessarily all just as uh, lovers towards us, um, as was the case with Smoky God, who, as a matter of fact, was trying to kill us in the end. Um, the only exception being the one who tried to uh, rescue us but of course he was the one who foresaw this, Fushi. And we have the demise of both of them. God damn, we just saw fucking Smoky God die in front of us. Like, uh, we can only see... <laughs> I still can only see so much death before that really fucks him up in the head. Although, although I suppose we have already seen a lot of fucked up things. And uh, it seems that there is possibly a revelation now that um, Wakan and Tangaroa are actually uh, one and the same with their Mugen part counterparts, their Infinity counterparts. Uh, which is interesting. I, I remember briefly seeing Wakan Tanka in one of the further back chapters, um, like regular Wakan Tanka, and I think he was being asked by maybe uh, Temujin uh, about his ability to only see uh, happy endings through his world pillar. Could it be that that is still the case, um, but what happened was that the invaders introduced them, the memories they've been holding with them all this time, for them to reclaim their positions as world representatives, not just of their world, but also uh, as players belonging to the invaders. I think that may be the case, honestly, um, because if we're to believe them, they really are just the same individual in the end. Um, 
and the invaders are known to have uh, memory manipulation to their extent, it seems possible that uh, they may be using San Kumara, for example, to instill these memories into them, or at least uh, remove the memories uh, that were previously onto them. But I'm not sure, honestly. Um, they, they seem to be a bit different from other world res representatives too, because they have infinite counterparts at all. The other rep representatives, of course, have lived through, at least in Smoky God's case, 5,670,000,000 lifetimes, uh, or loops anyways. Uh, and I would presume that's the case for most of the other world representatives as well, who remembered each and every single loop. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure what would make a walk-on and a Tangaroa special then, other than them learning it a bit later than directly from the start of the game. Um, it is peculiar though that uh, they didn't just simply remember um, that and were always like that to begin with, that is to say they're mute themselves. I think uh, what they're remembering is not what their sacred artifact lets us remember, but rather external memories that are being introduced by, perhaps by Isaac himself, through his uh, memory uh, interface. But who knows, who knows, this is all speculation at this point. Um, I just realized that Tino's kind of got a sideline in the end, and uh, I don't know what happened, but it seems that they never fully covered what happened to everyone's memories. Did they kind of gloss it off? It, uh, I think they mentioned that um, everyone is fine with us returning, which is a bit peculiar. Well, that was fast. I didn't see any wave of memory being reset. Maybe it was because of what Katoplupas did in trying to uh, assuage everyone's uh, fears and hatred towards us. But did that really work towards everyone? Of course, it might be possible if we consider it was the collective effort of all of the creators. But still, that's a pretty big effect, because what that means is they didn't actually just forget. Rather, they remember, they just changed their minds. Which means that everyone, not just the world representatives, but everyone should be keenly aware of all their memories now. So I feel like that should change everyday interactions at this point, uh, with them knowing the true nature of who we are in terms of us being uh, the carriers of all the exiles, as well as our role as a trophy in this game. But, you know, th there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'm very excited to see what happens in Chapter 13 whenever it got, gets translated. I really do wish one day that uh, they would be concurrently translated so that I can actually enjoy the current quests along with everyone else, uh, the node quests. Uh, from this quest, uh, hopefully I just unlocked the Chapter 12 uh, seed, seed and Blossom quests. All this time I've been doing the Chapter 11 one until now, so a bit of a bummer, but <laughs> I guess it's fine. Uh, I'm still grinding the mob anyways. Anyway, back to the story. Um, overall, I do hope Katobopas kind of uh, stays permanently with us. It's not that I kind of like, I was particularly fond of his design. I do like his kit, but you know, uh, I didn't really think much of him design was. But I do think his role in the story was really more friendly than usual. I, maybe that's just because he was kind of substituting the role of Ryota and Shiro and the rest of the summoners, but I, I feel like he was the closest friend with us compared to everyone else, and it would be a shame to kind of lose him in our everyday kind of uh, circle. Because uh, he seemed really cool. As for uh, Tindalos, uh, he's kind of... <laughs> I don't know, he's, he's funny, I guess. Uh, Blue's Clues got became Gara, I guess. But he kind of fell out, out of relevance super quickly once we got into the deep web. And uh, he had his tiny backstory, which didn't really matter in the end. Um, we also saw Smokey God, which goddamn, he died? He literally just died in front of us? Like, uh, actually, there's one on, only one other time he kind of sighed that, and that was the dismembered arm, which they still haven't talked about, although they did finally acknowledge in one of the dungeon memories, so <laughs> I really hope all of you have kept up with those dungeon memories, because they are mind-blowing, and they actually did uh, bring up, like, yeah, that, that missing arm was a relevant thing, but damn, some just died in front of us. <laughs> I don't know. That fact is pretty mind-blowing to me. Um, in Fushi's story, it seems that he himself desummoned uh, without us actually doing some final blow to lead to his summoning. So that was interesting in the sense that the people can leave whenever they want. Um, or rather, transients. I wonder who his original contract with this. I mean, presumably it could be us, but it doesn't have to be. Um, but it seems that they can terminate their own conscience them themselves that way. Um, but yeah, the Dragon Veins made a neat return. Uh, I forget the significance of them in terms of what they actually do. I think they're just energy sources of some kind that flows through the Earth. So some kind of intersection between the natural and uh, the you know, the power of rules, the magic. Um, but yeah, that, that was cool to see it. It's return to be made. Uh, Hecate, fun, me character. Um, we'll, we'll presumably see more of her in the next chapter, along with Kuniyoshi, who, you know, became relevant. Um, 
they're obviously just side characters in the end, but it's nice to see that they're permanent invasives, and who knows, maybe we'll see more of them. And <laughs> Arachne and Itzam getting the, the silhouette treatment, at least they exist, for sure, not just in our memories. Akiya Ganyan, it seems that plotline's still not fully complete. Uh, for the most, when we first showed up, we were just being introduced to his powers, what was what happened in the park. And then um, he kind of was just like, well, I'd love to stay, but I gotta go do this thing instead. He kind of did that several times. <laughs> uh, very busy as a fireman, I guess, or, you know, maybe a volunteer fireman. But um, the plotline will seem to continue with Daikoku, who mysteriously disappeared in the previous uh, chapter, uh, chapter 11, along with um, Tsukiyomi, which no one has breathed an ilk of this entire time, so I'm very worried about what happened to him. Um, but yeah, Daikoku uh, seems to have some sort of connection there with the invaders uh, along with San Kumara. So maybe those two... Huh. Now that I think about it, Daikoku was supposed to be with the warmongers, and yet, like, it seems that he he's working for the invaders now? We did realize that he effectively betrayed the warmongers in the previous chapter. Um, does that mean he's working for the invaders after all? Or maybe he's his own unaffiliated party? Um, I mean, after all, we are seeing a lot of these... Uh, Third choices, and not even just third choices, but choices beyond the three that are given to them, as was a uh, exploration of the AI, as well as the three philosophies of the true guild masters. I'm finally glad to be done with this because now I get to relax uh, after playing through this for several hours in a row. Anyway, uh, thank you for joining me, everyone. Uh, look forward to more content coming up in the future. Uh, have a nice day, everyone, and luck with everything. Bye bye.